Welcome to What to Do When, a podcast from real lawyers with real perspective, where we explore a variety of legal issues and scenarios. Each week, we focus on a new topic and discuss what to do when and if any of these legal scenarios ever happen to you or a loved one. With over 40 years of combined legal experience, our hosts offer their unique perspectives and insights on a range of real life legal situations. Welcome back to another podcast with Jackie and Scott here at Kreiser Cardani in Richmond, Virginia. What to do when? A dummy's guide to the legal verse. Real talk, real lawyers. All right, Scott, what's on the docket today? What to do when the court appoints a guardian ad litem? Uh, a guardian what? Excuse me? Guardian ad litem. Okay. Um, what is a guardian ad litem? Let's start there. This is a, a really important topic because a lot of people get this confused. A guardian ad litem is an attorney, number one. Okay. Who's appointed by the court to represent usually a child's best interest. That's not loaded. I don't know what is. So you're a lawyer for the child. A lawyer for the child, but not the same way I am a lawyer for a criminal defendant or a lawyer for a client. Um, and that's there's a lot of quasi there. But the idea is for us, there's certain factors in the code. We're supposed to look at those factors. But I want to say this before we get down that road, jumping ahead a little bit. But people need to understand a guardian item is not a social worker. A lot of people think this guardian litem all of a sudden becomes a social worker. We get involved in all the nuance. My job as a guardian litem is to represent the child's legal best interest. I still stay a lawyer. I'm looking out for their legal best interest, which may include some stuff from a social work perspective, but I don't morph into a social worker. I stay a lawyer. I still have the power to subpoena documents. I still have the power to put on evidence in court. I make an argument in court. Quite frankly, as a guardian litem, I actually make a recommendation to what I think to tell the court is in the child's best interest in the circumstances that are before the court. So how, how does a guardian ad litem get involved in a case to begin with? This Virginia is pretty big using guardian ad litems in a lot of cases, but the number one case is in a divorce or a custody case. And the idea is that the child's rights, legal rights, will be represented in that case because quite frankly, Frankly, when the guardian litem is not involved, there are times when the children's, the impact on the children is not even really considered okay. without having somebody there to say, hey, this is the impact. This is my recommendation based on that, those factors. Um, so it's really important. There's cool. also a code section that says if you have two competent lawyers, a guardian litem may be appointed, which means there's an option not to. But the idea of the guardian litem is to make sure that child's voice is heard in the courtroom. So sometimes I get questions from clients where a guardian ad litem is involved in their case, and they have questions like, can the guardian ad litem just talk to the judge privately? Maybe. And not really privacy, but it's really, there is a provision in the code that allows the guardian litem or even one of the attorneys to ask for an in-camera hearing. Those in-camera hearings can sometimes be where the lawyers are present, the, fa the parents aren't. Most lawyers I know here, at least locally in this Richmond area, greater Richmond area, kind of like to stay out of that and just let the judge talk to the child in the back well, room. You're sort of talking about the child talking to the judge. I mean, just the guardian ad litem. Do you have, you know, the red bat phone to the judge? Oh, I'm sorry. No. No. I misunderstood that. No, I have no contact with the judge outside of court, which was really inside of court. Is my only contact is to tell the judge what. But in a way, I kind of take on a rule of a quasi-judge in the sense of I become his eye... Technically, I would kind of become his eyes and ears, and I make an investigation about this case, and I report back to the judge what my findings are. He can totally say, you're crazy, you're in a loon, I'm not going to follow your recommendations. Sure, or sure, your, sure. But my job is to kind of, I go out to the crime scene, so to speak, and I look at the evidence, which he can't get off the bench or she can't get off the bench and do. That's kind of my role, is to kind of take that role on. And so, where, I mean, what might you do as a guardian ad litem? Who are you going to see? Who are you trying to talk to? And why? Okay. The why is best interest. And I know that's a loaded term. But what we mean by that is the idea is to get the best possible circumstance for this child going forward. 
So what's in his best interest? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that his best interest supersedes the family best interest, but his best interest has to be considered. And that's that's the way you're looking at it. So my job is to find out what the child's best interest is. And to do that, obviously, I mean, for lawyers, we have to have a face-to-face with the child. Now, when the child's two months old, I don't know how much you gain from that sometimes. I mean, but you can gain abuse and damage and dirty and those kind of things. But as far as or commu- clean and healthy and yeah, but as far as communication, you're not going to get much. So, you know, that that value probably goes up as the kid gets older, that face to face communication. And and is it fair to say that you're you're going to talk to the child or a guardian is going to speak to the child or other witnesses? Um, because sometimes the parents don't accurately represent what's going on with the child. I think that's the biggest thing is even if they're trying to, they have their own spin. Spin. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all look, you know, we say this all the time as lawyers. We can have seven people watch the same accident out in front of our building, and they would each probably give you a little different version of what happened as they see it based on their frame of reference. So the same thing's true in a divorce or a custody case. Mom may see it from her perspective, dad may see it from his perspective. It's nice to have that child's perspective and that child's perspective be brought forward. And then the court has three different perspectives sure. he gets to look at instead of two. And what about the school? If the child's school age is the guardian ad litem going to go to the school? Yeah, we can. The guardian ad litem's powers are pretty broad to go almost talk to anybody. The back of the order that we're appointed on in like the lower courts, the juvenile court, for instance, gives pretty broad powers. I mean, I can subpoena. I can talk to doctors, I can talk to counselors, I can talk to, and I rarely, if ever, get refused on any of this. I can walk into a school at 2.15 and say, hey, I'd like to speak to the, the child, and I have that right. Well, you, you raised something important. You said medical records, doctors, therapists, for the child or for, for the, the child. For the child is the primary. I mean, there's ways to get other things and, and parents involved, and that's a... I think that's a whole other wicked and discovery and talking about that. But um, the real issue is my role is to investigate the child's best interest. So maybe there is an issue with mom's mental health, for instance. Maybe the child tells me that every three hours she goes into a rage or is gone or whatever. Sure. Then I might have a reason to try to start to figure that out and figure out what I need to do. And maybe it does involve getting her medical records or something. And you know, if that lady's represented, they, or their attorney may file some kind of motion and we may have to argue it in court. But I pretty much have carte blanche access. Okay. I mean, I started doing this in 1996 as a guardian item. Been doing it that long. So, you know, it's amazing how much you can get, what you can do. And, mm-hmm. but I've also learned in all of that time, there's, there's things to pursue and then there's things not to pursue. And sometimes you can pursue an issue and you think it's really hunky dory and really what it does is create greater division and it doesn't help. And it's, you have to be wise about that, I think, as a guardian ad litem. So when you are involved as a guardian ad litem and um, a parent, you're you're going to interview a parent. What, what should a parent do? Let's make that list shorter. What should they not do? A parent should never fill in the blank when dealing with a guardian ad litem. Well, number one, never refuse the uh, okay. the the contact. That just that's just a giant red flag. Now, the code and the ethics say that as a guardian lamb, I send a I'll send a form to your your attorney saying, "Hey, what kind of contact do you want me to have? Can I have face to face with your client without you there, or do you want to be present?" And I certainly believe that you have the right to be represented, as I've said through every podcast sure. at any stage. So I don't find that offensive. I do think sometimes guardian items think you're hiding something if your lawyer's there. There's a suspicion that can grow there. So my my idea is if you don't need your lawyer there, maybe you don't need him there. But there are some times when it's, you know, a crazy case and there's a lot of allegations flying back and you want your attorney there with you when you answer any questions because it's that kind of a show that's really bad and, you know, Anything you say can and will be used against you. So And so if someone's attorney says to you as the guardian, no, I just want my client to have contact with you with me present. Okay, that's fine. Um, at what point should the person really be worried if they haven't heard from the guardian in that scenario? 
Well, there's two scenarios there, I think. Um, if your guardian item hasn't talked to you or your attorney, you should be worried that your side is not being heard, period. I mean, that's okay. that's okay. got to happen. Um, I have some very, let's take if before Jackie and I were together, if I needed it, some information about Jackie's client from Jackie, I could call her and know that I was getting a really good information that I needed. I might not need to call the client in that space, especially if Jackie said, hey, I want you to go through me. And sometimes it's just easier to go through Jackie because sure, I'm going to sure. get the same answer. But, you know, and again, what's the issue in the case? Is it that mom's a horrific person and the house is a mess and dangerous and all those things? Then my role kind of changes about how much I need to go see the mom at her house and be there and be present. One of the rules I have as a guardian item that a lot of people don't like, and I've just done this so long now since I started this, was if I show up and you know I'm coming, I'm not going to see the same person that I came to see. Or maybe even the same house or circumstances exactly. or any of that. Right? I can't tell you how many times I've walked. When I first started, I used to call ahead and make a 2 o'clock appointment, and I'd show up at 1.30, and there'd be people throwing trash in the trash bins and you know, like this manic really frantic cleaning, cleaning up, up yeah. and, you know, or, you know, you get to the house and the kid's in a little three-piece suit. You know, I'm exaggerating, but my point is that everything's hunky-dory and the kid's scared to death. And so, um, you know, there's all those things that can happen. So I always find that spontaneous visits can really give me a better lay of the land. And I also, and I think a lot of attorneys, or guardian line, attorneys who act as guardian limes do this is... Um, a lot of times I'll go to the school or some third party place to talk to the kid. Sure. I, I even find that when they come into my office with a parent, sometimes the parent being in the other room, they're just not as loose or open or whatever. When I go to the school, they go there every day. They're safe there. They feel like they don't have their parental interaction there normally. So they feel pretty open. They're pretty, they're guard down a lot. And I find that a really good place to get some. Well, you know, Scott, I've had a lot of a lot of clients say, well, you know, the guardian went to the school and are they even allowed to do that? And absolutely a guardian is allowed to do that. Sometimes that's after uh, I get involved after the case has been going on for a little while. I try to prepare clients that um, w what a guardian is supposed to do and how to interact with the guardian, to be honest with the guardian. And if they're unsure how to communicate something to the guardian, that they really should be talking to their, to their lawyer first and, and deciding and ascertaining whether that information is relevant and helpful. So, so Scott, when does a guardian ad litem, when do their duties start and when do they end? Yeah, that's really important because I think a lot of people have great misunderstanding about this too. My involvement begins when that court order is signed, basically. Without a court order, without an appointment that's called, I am not the guardian of litem. Okay. So it's, it's a very important distinction because my appointment also ends the day that case finalizes. So, for instance, in, in Virginia, we go by case numbers. We have case CJ11673.01, right? Okay. So that might be, if it's custody, it's probably going to be a JJ number. <laughs> Not that that matters. But anyways, at the end of that case, the judge has heard the evidence. He, she, or, he or she makes a ruling. My next assignment is to explain that to the child and tell them what's going to go on and, and finish my representation. As soon as I finish that representation, I'm done. So unless the court, sometimes the court will say the guardian item stays on for six more months. But my point is, if in three months from now something happens, I, I'm not, I'm not appointed, and well, I really you couldn't don't, run interference in the case. In other words, yeah. if if after the case closes, something's going on. Yeah, technically, I could probably file a motion to be reappointed at that moment. But in that moment, there's I'm, no order. I'm no, I'm not there, and I have. People call me years later and say, hey, you were the guardian lighting for my son last year, and I'm having this problem with his dad, and I always have to say, I'm not appointed. But you're the guardian lighting. I was the guardian lighting. You're correct, but I'm not the guardian lighting. And it is a distinction, and I just don't want to fall foul of a judge by doing stuff that I, I mean, i not appointed to do. And so uh, have there been cases that you've been a part of where there was an initial petition, maybe it was a divorce or maybe it was separated parents, maybe it was parents who were never married. And then that case went on for a long time and it ended final order. 
and then one of the parents filed a motion to amend something needed to change and you were reappointed. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've been, you know, and the judges, I think, in, in goodness, try to keep that same attorney appointed unless there's a reason not to. And that kind of goes to another topic. I'm sure you're going to ask me, can you get rid of a guardian light if you uh, don't that like is, it? That's the next question. What happens if you, what happens if somebody doesn't like the guardian ad litem? Can they get them removed from a case? You know, that to me, doing this as long as I've done it, um, is a really hard question to answer because it really depends on the factual basis of why you want that guardian removed and also what you can essentially prove. This is not a he said, she said argument. You know, you can't sure. just go, well, I don't like him. He didn't show up at my house. And I was in court the other day with a friend of mine and some guy was, the case had been over for a year and somehow they, he, he saw this guardian light him in the courthouse and they happened to be there at the same time, which is kind of weird. But anyways, he said, on your bill a year ago, you said that you were never at my house. And he goes, really? Or he said, you were at my house and you never came to my house. He goes, really? He said, you mean the condo that had this, <laughs> this furniture and, and this through. and oh, okay. that? It was kind of funny, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of, you know, that, that's just where I'm going with that. Well, sometimes. that's interesting that you brought up the bill. Wait a minute. There's a bill. The court appoints a guardian ad litem to represent a child's best interest and there's a bill going to the parents for that? Yeah, this is how it works. If we're appointed in the in by the court, the juvenile court, must be really specific, or a lower court, it's usually done through a state appointment. It's kind of like a court-appointed fee. The fee is $55 out of court and $75 in court. For, what, what do you mean? Per hour. Per hour, okay. Sorry. <laughs> and um, so... That fee, at the end, I turn that fee, whatever that is, I charge $300 total. I turn that fee into the court. The court is required to make a determination based on the parent's income, whether they can pay and how much of that bill they should pay. And that's a, they have a formula. I, I've looked at it, but I haven't really, I couldn't tell you what the formula is anymore, but it's kind of like child support formula. There's a, the, the, oh, okay. The General Assembly has come up with this formula and percentages and all this stuff, and they take your income, plug it into the formula, and figure out what percentage you would owe that $300. And is sometimes does one parent have to pay and the other not? Quite often, depending on the indigency of the parent, which means their poverty or whatever you want to say, or they're not making a lot of money. And so you, you made a distinction when talking about the juvenile court, which would be Virginia's family court, versus the circuit court, which would be either either our divorce court or if a juvenile court matter was appealed to the circuit court. Well, and that's, that's kind of funny because if it's appealed from the juvenile court, you kind of remain on that court-appointed financial arrangement. Okay. So, But if the case, a custody case, starts in circuit court or it's the divorce that starts in circuit court and the court appoints, then I get hired as a lawyer at my normal rate, whatever that rate is. Um, what, who hires you? The court hires me. Basically, really, the parties hire me. <laughs> the court orders it, but it's really the, the parties. And then I have a standard contract, just like you did when you signed up for your lawyer. I ask for a retainer, and I work out of the retainer. Just from like both I, people? For or both if, people. From, okay. And what if one person says they're not paying? <laughs> that can be a mess. And I've had people pay the other side and then just bring it up in the divorce and try oh, to figure okay. it out that way. I've had other people file motions and, but unless the judge says otherwise, my job as a guardian litem is to collect fee equally from both parties. And I expect that. And if I don't get communication, quite frankly, I wonder what's going on that this person thinks they have, <coughs> excuse me, the ability to stub their nose at a court order and just not pay me. It happens. It happens. I mean, we have people who disobey laws and court orders all the time, but... Uh, but let me say something about that because it's really important. Okay. Behavior matters to a guardian litem. Mm -hmm. And to a court. And to a court. So when I see you in court as a guardian litem and a parent acting a fool and no respect, no restraint in front of the judge and none of this, I think, whoa, wonder what's going on in the home when nobody's there watching. Right. If you're doing this in a court in front of a judge with deputies and attorneys and all this, what's going on behind closed so doors? So the same thing with payment. Uh, you know, if somebody calls me and says, hey, I don't have the money to pay you. I don't know what I'm going to do. That's a lot different than, screw you, I'm not paying that bill. Sure. Because that tells me 
it starts to make me question whether they're going to follow any kind of order we would enter, how they're going to how they're going to maintain those kind of things. And it, that's an important function, quite frankly. All right, Scott, as a guardian ad litem, can you be both a guardian ad litem in the same case that you're a lawyer? No. No. And what can you not do as a guardian ad litem? Maybe the better question is, what are your limitations? I think I like, what can you not do? What are you prohibited from doing as a guardian ad litem? I don't know. I can't really think of anything, honestly. I mean, I can subpoena, I can ask questions, I can interrogate witnesses, I can do depositions, all the things normal. I'm a lawyer. So I have all the rights and privileges. I think the difference is, as a guardian ad litem, you don't have quite the standard of... Um, confidentiality that's where i was headed yeah that you do with like jackie if she's representing mom she her duty of confidentiality is extreme huge mine is a little different although there's a caveat to that but i have to do what's in the best interest of the child and sometimes i have to spill the beans about a situation because it's such a dangerous situation that my client may be at risk but who is your duty of confidentiality to? I honestly don't really think of it that way. I think it's to my client with a caveat that I have to be, I have to present their best interest to the court. So sometimes that's, that's, the, that's the buffer for me. But if one of the lawyers tells you something about their client or about a teacher or something that happened in school, do you have a duty to, be, to remain uh, confidential with that attorney or that party? Not necessarily. Right. So yeah, not usually. <laughs> so a lot of times I tell my clients, just be aware that they don't have a duty to protect the information that you give them, not to withhold information intentionally, not to hide or sneak because, because if a guardian finds out that you're lying about something or hiding something, or you were not honest and I'm, and I mean by not omitting. So I don't mean just like, no, I didn't say it didn't happen. I just didn't tell you about it. If you omit something very important, you could really run into problems with your guardian. But I do em emphatically remind people that, that they do not, they, the guardian does not have a duty of confidentiality to that client, to the other parent, uh, to the teachers that their, their job is to go in and really investigate the cases as it's unfolding um, and not to protect information that's coming in from different parties. And I think another kind of red flag and things I've seen over the years, unfortunately, when you've done this a long time, right? there are some very inappropriate guardian items, and I think they cross boundaries. Ooh. I think there's all kinds of things. I mean, like, should I be go should you be going to lunch with a guardian item? That should be a big red flag to you that something's not right The lawyer there. or the party? The party. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, and I, I've seen that. I've seen, you know, why don't we meet it, you know, this time or in this place or, you know, just crazy things like that. You know, I think sometimes total power goes to the head a little too far. Okay. And um, it's, it's a sad situation because we are really my job is to stay pretty neutral with either party. Now, I can draw a conclusion or a, an opinion about that party based on their behavior. But my initial reaction is. um to stay pretty neutral. And I, I, it's been funny over the years. I've had some conversations with some people screaming and bawling me out on the phone. And I kind of stop and say, do you realize what my job is? And it's funny. I, I try not to hold that against people because I realize they're in a very emotional situation sure. and it's, it's their life. So I try to be pretty leather skinned, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, this is the one person who can really help them. Right. And they're making these kind of decisions to call me names. And again, I guess what I'm saying, if you believe there's some hinky going on, go talk to your lawyer and let them handle it. Don't try to do it yourself because you come off wrong. That's just all there is to it. And you know, every let, time, every time you let your lawyer be the bad guy, right? You know, don't, don't become the bad guy. I mean, again, I, I just even really, for instance, say, and this is a stupid example, but don't think it didn't ever happen. But for instance, say your lawyer says, hey, why don't you and I go to or your guardian lawyer says to the mom, why don't you and I go to lunch and we can talk about your case? I'll pay. You know, the right answer isn't to go, I can't believe you're doing that. About you're inappropriate. But no, you go, no, thank you. And you call your attorney. Sure. That SOB just asked me to lunch. 
And, and I think he wanted more than lunch. And do you think it'd be appropriate? I mean, I do. If my client called me and said that their guardian ad litem asked them to lunch, male, female, purple polka dot, doesn't matter to me. I would very promptly file a motion to relieve the guardian ad litem and appoint someone new. And I don't do that. That is a general practice that I avoid because it strains the relationship between the attorneys and the guardian ad litem as well as the guardian ad litem and the parties if there aren't good reasons for the for having the guardian removed. But I think in that situation it would be I'd be hard pressed to call the attorney to call the guardian ad litem first. I would I would probably file the motion first and uh, thankfully in 17 years I haven't faced that but well and I'll tell you what makes it difficult is guardian ad litem serve at a very minimal cost number one I mean we're we're lawyers getting paid $55 an hour I mean that may sound like to the electrician that's a lot of money but when we pay our overhead and all the things that we have to deal with it's really not a lot of well, it's not a lot of money work, retained work pays a lot more money yeah so the point is the courts kind of get that, that we're offering a service to the court. Okay. And you build up credibility with the court over years of doing this. And the court can learn, well, this is a, this guy I trust because he's never lied to me before. So when you have somebody that's built a lot of equity with the court, a lot of trust for the mm -hmm. court, and you don't like them, that can be a real problem to even get that person off. I've had, I've watched cases and even asked, been involved where the guardian line has been asked to be removed. And the court's like, well, I've known this attorney for 14 years and he served me well. I, I'm just not buying what you're selling. And that, and that, see, but then now, and on the backside of that, now you as the guardian have, uh, talk about a, a difficult situation to be in. Somebody's asked you to be removed, either a party or their attorney. And the judge says, I'm not doing it. I mean, how do you handle that as the guardian? Yeah, it, it really... I firmly believe a lot of people get an attitude about that. And then you're, you as the client who's asked for that are not going to have a good recommendation from the guardian line. I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's what I believe. I mean, maybe not every guardian is going to do that, but you have to be aware that it could happen. And people, it's in the back of people's mind, whether you like it or not. But I mean, I sat in a courtroom one time where it was the exact situation I was talking to you before. The attorney representing a certain party had one of the requests that I be at all the meetings, right? So okay. the guardian litem, this was a very infant child. So the guardian litem had made his initial face-to-face -face, um, interaction. The case had kind of taken a different turn with some things that really had nothing to do with the child. And so there was a lot of interaction between the guardian litem and the two attorneys. So as this <laughs> guardian litem came to court, the other attorney filed a motion and said, well, you've only talked to my client one time and filed a motion based on the lack of communication, which there's a, because of the code and what we're supposed to do as guardian limes, there's a basis for that. I think it was a really poorly done because it wasn't a case where that needed to be done as much and it okay. didn't really matter. It wasn't that that attorney wasn't communicating. The guardian line wasn't communicating. It wasn't getting facts and evidence regularly and doing his job. Mm -hmm. He just had, because of the circumstance, because of the barrier sort of the attorney had put in there by, you got to go through me, he just went to him to get the information he needed. And this was a case where, it, like I said, nobody was nobody was contesting the home. Nobody was contesting the conditions the kids were living under. That wasn't the issues in the case. So okay. going to mom's home three times didn't really matter. Sure, sure. So, you know, but I thought, man, that was poor form. You know, and so... I don't know, but I mean, it's really hard to get a guardian item removed. It's very rarely done. You better have some good reasoning, and it can't be because I don't like them. The personality conflict is not a good enough reason to have a guardian removed. And quite frankly, they're representing your child. You should do everything you can to avoid a personality conflict. You're an adult. Do your best. I know it's hard. I know some guardian items are super arrogant, super and prickly, prickly, prickly and all that kind of stuff. But man, just just take the high road. That's my biggest advice. Take the high road. Communicate your issues with your attorney. Let them decide if it's gotten to the level where there needs to be something happen. But don't you engage it. 
it won't help. It does not help your case. Well, and, and next time or on another podcast, I want to get into how a guardian ad litem is involved in a child protective services case and how that's different from just a custody battle between maybe parents or grandparents or interested third parties with the parents, whatever the custody battle is, and how a guardian ad litem's role could be different in a child protective services case. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of What to Do When. For more episodes, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, and we encourage you to check our archives to listen to previous topics. Tune in next week for a new episode and some fresh perspective from Kreiser Cardani.